Um, so you will all be better people after this. It's my promise I've just made, apparently. So um, good luck to me. Uh, <laughs> also, he's already explained my talk, so all the pressure's off. I don't have to really try anymore, which is nice. Um, OK, so making 10% time effective. Um, before anybody congratulates me on having such incredible slides, I stole them off the internet. All well, the content is mine. The pictures are not mine. I don't have any skills. So um, I'm here to talk about 10% time. Uh, who am I? Hopefully this is going to work. Yes. Hello. <laughs> I'm Emily. Um, I'm a software engineering manager at OVO. Um, I started out as a software engineer at Bloomberg. Um, I was a C++ engineer for my SINs for about four and a half years. Um, and then I was a team lead. And then for the last just over a year and a half, I've been at OVO managing the international teams. So we're currently looking at expanding into new countries. Um, and I'm leading a team of people that um, is trying to launch over France, over Spain, more countries next year. It's pretty exciting. So I think I wouldn't really be doing my job as a conference speaker if I didn't talk very briefly about OVO Energy and what it does and who we are and how amazing it all is. Um, so who here has already heard of it? It's written on your lanyards, so you should have at least seen the name before. <laughs> um, so it's an energy technology company. Um, we're really like our mission as a company is to um, fuel clean, uh, human progress by bringing clean, affordable energy to everyone. Um, that's that's the motto. Um, but the idea is that we're doing that with tech. So we're trying to um, really solve the problems that we see coming up in the future of energy um, using incredible technology. So um, being event sourced, thinking about uh, how the energy world is going to live in the future with renewable energies, like how we need to solve those problems. Um, we have offices here in Bristol, in London, which is where I'm based. Edinburgh, we're now opening offices in Paris and Madrid and Melbourne uh, for the international thing I've already mentioned. Our tech team is 300 people big, roughly. Um, and we have a lot of languages that we're using. So our main ones are Scala and JavaScript. Um, but we really have a focus on or small teams that make a lot of decisions for themselves. So we really care about each individual team being able to pick the tools and processes that makes the most sense for them and their product so that they can own their process end to end. This is all relevant, so I'm telling you. <laughs> um, so. Um, it will, it will become clear why I'm saying this. I also want to talk about the role of a software engineering manager, um, the role that I am. I'm the person on the rocket, kind of. Um, so I'm help there isn't a specific team leader per team at OVO because we encourage our teams to run themselves. So software engineering managers sit above multiple teams, normally about three. Um, and we're here to provide line management and personal development for each um, engineer, improvements to way of working, and also setting technical direction and trying to connect people together um, across different um, disciplines and also goals. How each manager goes about this is completely unique to them. I think that's what's really special about the job. So for me, it's really about enabling and empowering individuals and then just getting the heck out of the way so that they can get on and do the job and the work that they know how to do and, and enjoy doing. So it's about creating opportunities and trusting and supporting them um, in order for them to do their best work and, and be the most efficient they can be. So 10% time. Who's currently doing 10% time? Or like hack days, it might also be called. OK, who knows about it but doesn't do it? OK, that's not bad. I'll tell you about it anyway. Um, so 10% time is literally 10% of your time back to do what you want with it. So it kind of was coined by, I think Google were the first ones to do it. They do 20% time. So one day every week, or for 10% time, one day every two weeks. Uh, where you have specific time that you're meant to spend improving yourself or your product or thinking about a completely new way to use your skills. Um, for me, 10% time is really about what I've kind of written on the slide here, like gone are the days of the idea of a code monkey, you know, you just engineer sits and they do what they're told and they don't have any original thought. At OVO, we really try and appreciate engineers for what they are. They're like valuable employees with incredible insight into their customers and the tech that they're using and how to make their lives and their world better, more efficient, um, and really creating space for people to use that um, know-how uh, in order to improve themselves, the work that they do. Um, I also want to talk briefly about motivation. I don't know who here has read Dan Pink's book, Drive. Some people. I'd highly recommend it if you haven't. Um, but there's this incredible YouTube video that's in my slides if, you, if I'm going to send them out later, probably. Um, but he talks about this idea. They've uh, done some studies to try and work out how you can motivate people to do better work. 
Um, so they originally were looking at this as economists to try and work out what money really meant to people. Like if you paid people more money, would they do more work? Um, and they kind of inclusively, conclusively proved that that is not the case. You can't pay people more money and get them to do more work. Um, you have to pay them enough so that they don't worry about money anymore and then money has no impact. In fact, it has a negative impact. So uh, for people who are using their brains and have cognitive skill, um, you need to motivate them in another way. And he talks about these three different um, things, categories of, of, uh, of motivation that kind of come together to form meaningful work that people enjoy doing and want to, want to improve at. So there's these three things. First one being mastery. So mastery here being, you know, whatever it is that you do, getting better at that thing. Um, autonomy being having the direction set by yourself. You know, you're able to say, I want to do this, I don't want to do that. This seems important, that doesn't seem important. Um, I want to be able to set my own direction. And then purpose, coming around something that means something to you, like that you understand and you care about the work that you're doing, um, or, you know, work here being a kind of loose term, whatever it is that you're doing. So these three things to me, um, they are 10% time, like 10% time is literally this. You're there to improve yourself, that's mastery. You're allowed to pick what you want to do, that's autonomy. And the company is trying to give you a purpose, right? Like that your stuff will be used or that there'll be a valuable end goal for the thing that you're building. I actually also think that this isn't just, you know, it's not meant to be just in 10% of the time, right? We should be trying to do this all the time. <laughs> there isn't just like, oh, we only do the stuff we want to do and have an amazing um, and important career in 10% of our work. We should be in 90% of the work, but it talks about 10% time, so we'll at least try and focus on that. So um, how did I get here? How did I get to the point where I'm doing a talk about 10% time? Um, when I start with a new team, when I come in and I take on um, new engineers, new reports, and, and think about new projects, um, what I really care about is trying to find a health between two things, short-term and long-term goals. So there tends to be a focus in your day-to-day -day about the short-term, the urgent need, you know, like you need to get this sprint finished, or you need to get this piece of work done, or you have a deadline, or, you know, the bug is bothering you, or your product owner is bothering you, or you're getting emails, and... When you come into a team, you might often look at like their velocity or how good is their breakdown of work or um, how aligned are they with the KPIs. These, are, these for me are short-term goals, right? They'll tell you how well a team is doing immediately. They, they probably will be okay in the next three months, but it's not really gonna tell you very much about how they're gonna do next year or in six months um, because a long-term goal, if you don't think about it and spend time on it, then it's just going to um, wither. <laughs> so a long-term goal is more about how sustainably are you paying down tech debt? How are you thinking about whether or not your architecture or your system design is going to scale as your problem scales, as your product scales? Are you thinking about where you've got redundancy and where you should be improving um, your process? Are you thinking about where you need to, you know, I've already mentioned scalability, but, you know, scaling your, your deployment cycle or, you know, there's like much bigger problems that just kind of simmer under the surface. And if we don't spend time all the time thinking about those things and trying to spend time, you know, actually not, you must get this done right now, but just larger questions require larger thought and larger amounts of time. And, and how much time, you know, ask yourselves, how much of your, your time are you spending thinking about what's your product going to be doing in six months and, and trying to do some work now so that it doesn't fall over later? So when I, as I say, when I join new teams, I tend to ask these questions, first of all, about the short term health of the team and see if anything needs to be done there. And then about the long term health, like, are we actually kind of paying down the debt that we're building up in order to maintain a sustainable level of deployment and development? Um, and more often than not, actually, in nearly every case, there is no long term health at all. People very rarely think about the long term. They only really care about the short term because it's a little bit more exciting and because there's a need. You know, someone's there saying, quick, do this. I need it for my customers or whatever it is. So you're dealing with that problem, but you aren't thinking about your long term problems and, and your per long term personal development or what's going to happen in five years, 10 years time. So. That's how I got here. I was like, well, how do we create this space and time for people to think about long term things? How do we ensure that we're you know, dealing with the short term urges as they come up, but also thinking about our long term development and making sure that we're kind of you know, paying down the cost of today for the future of tomorrow? That's quite good. I should write that down. Um, so what are we trying to improve? I want to be a bit more specific about each of these things that we're trying to do for the long term health um, of the team. So the first thing is yourself. What are you doing to improve as an engineer? How do you continue to learn and grow? How do you want to keep up to date with this never change, never ending world of tech? Um, it's fair to say that nothing really stays still in this uh, in this um, 
career, if you want to call it that. Um, so how, how do you keep up to date? How do you create time to keep up to date? And you know, I was saying earlier, um, if it's in your personal time, then I think that's a failure. That like, if your job requires you to stay up to date and you need to be kind of bringing new ideas and thinking about new things in order to be good at your job, then your job should also create space for you to be able to do that, right? You should have time to do it during office hours so that when you're at home, you can have a bath with some wine. Maybe that's just me. Um, so the second thing is product. This is kind of what I was hinting at before. Do you have time to think about the long-term impact of the product you work on and whether you're heading in the right direction? Are you actually doing the right thing? Does anybody know? I mean, I don't. Like, are we thinking about it at least? You know, are we ch just checking in and seeing whether or not we're actually doing the right thing or whether or not we need to change? Was that decision we made a year ago still working out for us or actually do we need to do something quite drastic? And if we don't spend time really thinking about these questions and seeing whether or not sanity checking that we're actually heading in the right direction, then you can almost guarantee that you are not. And the last thing is process. So are you getting time to implement improvements to your workflow or code base to make your life easier? Um, I mean, are you? <laughs> um, there are so many things where what I find the most invigorating when a new person comes into the team that they ask these questions of like, why are you doing that? Why are you ignoring that failing test that's always been there? Why are you constantly pressing four right buttons and a down button in order to get this thing to do what you want it to do? It's like, oh, well, I just always did it that way and I haven't really thought about it in years. So, you know, getting that time to be like, actually, could I make my life a bit easier? Could I fix that failing test that we've just been ignoring for ages? Or could I, you know, uh, automate that manual process that would give me, you know, 20 minutes back over a two week period. But actually, that's a lot of time if you add it all up um, and actually, in, you know, enjoy that process as well and build something that's valuable and um, and that other people can use and has a larger impact than you might think if um, if you don't get time to do it. So. We've asked all these great questions. We can say that we've said no to all of those things and we actually need to spend some time to do this and it's time to get organized. Um, so I love being organized. So the first thing that I tend to do is kind of go around to each individual and trying to get them to understand what the point of 10% time is, right? In order for 10% time to be effective, which is the point of the talk, is you need to know what it's for, right? If it's just, you get some time and you get to do some stuff and after that I'll have Gmail. Um, it's it's not that at all, right? You can't just go away and come back and be like, have you done anything yet? Um, it doesn't work like that. You have to have a plan, you know? You have to know what it is that you're aimed at and that you have like motivation and you understand the direction that you're going in. And maybe you can create that at an individual level, but making sure that everybody's bought into the same thing is the point of management in my eyes. So going around and making sure that everyone understands what it is that the purpose of the day is, like that we all, un like, start to think about collectively, what do we want to do with that time? Uh, what, is it, what are the problems that we want to solve? Where do we want to improve? How do you want to get there? Because you need to do that before you start your day. Otherwise, when you get there and you're doing 10% time, you're just sitting, looking at your hands, blinded by panic. Um, a secondary thing that I think is really important is that not just individuals should do it, but that teams should do it. And not just like a single team, but multiple teams. That teams that don't necessarily work together because their products aren't related or they do completely different things will more often than not have a lot in common. So this is where my original point about OVO's small autonomous teams finally becomes relevant. Um, because each team, so when I first started at OVO, um, I had a group of teams referred to as like the group platform teams. So they built tools which were used internally, basically. So we had the authentication platform, we had the customer email sending platform, and we had the data pipeline maintaining team. They had better names than that, but it explains their purpose better. Um, so uh, they all did completely different things, right? They're all solving very different problems. They were all, you know, uh, enabling each other to do different things, but they actually, they all had one thing that brought them together, which is they were building software that other people wanted to use around the company. That was their kind of uniting purpose. And that was the point of bringing those teams together to be the group platform teams in the first place. But just that enough wasn't really creating a group sensation for those teams. Um, and so this is why I felt it was really important that they did 10% time together, that these three teams that didn't have a lot to do with each other during the working day, during 90% of the time, would be able to come together over shared problems and shared ideas during that 10% time. One, because they actually would work together in a way that they wouldn't uh, normally, but also kind of giving them the opportunity to build that group um, sen like sense so that they actually you know, meant something to work together. So teams, I feel like you should have multiple teams that do it together to give them a chance to work together on problems that affect multiple areas. Um, 
to find common ground so that they actually understand each other's problems and can help solve across uh, team boundaries. And teams that solve problems together stay together, guys. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> as a manager, that was a big thing for me, was that if we didn't kind of bring these teams together and, and make them feel like they were part of something a bit bigger than just their individual bit, they would become disconnected from the rest of the, uh, the organization. So really important for me that they had an opportunity to stay together and work on something meaningful. Um, so yeah, there we go. That's why teams should do it. So here we go. Here's the gold, my favorite slide. How do we do it? What's the, what's the effectiveness that I'm bringing in? So the first thing I think is really important is stand up. Like we do stand up every day to talk about our alignment to product goals. We all know why stand up is really important, but then on 10% time, we just don't do it because we're like, eh, it's 10% time, we don't have to do stand up. But we do 10% time stand up on 10% time. So we get together at 10 a.m., all the teams that are doing 10% time that day might not be every single individual because some people are working on product work or have an outage, like these things happen, it's okay. But anybody who is doing 10% time will come together and we'll talk about what their plan is for the day. So they're talking about, you know, oh, well, I was working on this last time and I'm going to keep going on it this time, or, oh, I found this cool tool that I want to try, or, oh, I want to, you know, learn about this new thing and I found this blog post or this video or this lecture or whatever and I'm going to watch it and uh, talk about it later. So it gives everyone an opportunity to actually say what they're going to do out loud, which means they're like 100 times more likely to do it. <laughs> um, and that other people can hear what they're doing and have an opportunity to work with them if they want to. So um, if you know, you're coming into 10% time, it's perfectly fine to say, oh, I don't really know what I'm going to do, but you know, I'll listen to what everyone else is doing and, and see if I want to join in. Um, so this was something you know, really important, the stand up, uh, so that everyone you know, gets into the right mindset and is ready to do um, effective work that day, either with other people or on their own. The wrap up. So I have this, so we do 10% time on a Friday, every other Friday. Um, and at 4 p.m. on a Friday, I book in this half hour meeting, which is like the 10% time wrap up. So everyone who's done 10% time uh, comes together and talks about what they've done that day. It's my favorite meeting I ever go to, and I'm a manager, so I've done my research. Um, and it's just, it's just so much fun, you know? It's like an incredible opportunity for everyone to come together and just laugh on a Friday afternoon and eat Maltesers and talk about what they've achieved in the day, even if it's, I did some work on this project, I tried a proof of concept on this new tool, uh, but it was rubbish and I gave up on it. You know, like I found that it had these problems and it's not relevant for our use case, so we're not gonna use it. Like that's not a waste of time. It's a really valuable use of time. Like you've learned a lot from that experience, but if you don't really get an opportunity to say to people, I did this work, I found this tool, it wasn't that worthwhile, it feels like a waste of time. So really important to kind of get this opportunity to come together and talk about um, what you've done and, and what you've achieved. Also, it's my secret weapon because it means the hour between three and four on a Friday is possibly the most productive I ever see anybody be at that time on a Friday because they want to get stuff finished before wrap up. And you can see them all there like, why <laughs> bugs? Um, but it's amazing. I highly recommend this meeting to anyone who's doing 10% time. Um, we actually have it right before we do uh, kind of company-wide talk. So we have these tech talks that happen every other Friday that people can do quite often someone will come to 10% time and they'll write the talk in 10% time, talk about it in the wrap, well, I'll just say that they did it in the wrap up and then we'll all leave the wrap up together and go to their talk and listen to them give their talk. And it's a really nice kind of wholesome experience for the team. And then the last thing, Trello board. You need one, board of your choice, doesn't have to be Trello, other, uh, equipment is available, but it's just so important to keep track of these ideas. You know, so often I had people say, oh, well, I would do 10% time, but I don't really know what I'm going to do with that time. And I'm like, you're a liar. <laughs> you just don't remember what you want to do with that time. So um, it's much more important that you actually have somewhere that people can write these ideas down when they have them. So when I'm in a one-to-one -one with someone and we're discussing, oh, I'm really annoying. I spent all of yesterday doing this thing. I really wish I didn't have to do it. I'd be like, well, put your idea of like on 10% time and you can have a look at how you can not do that thing anymore. Or you're in a retro and you're talking about, oh, well, this disaster happened because we didn't have the right kind of blah. Like, I wish we had a tool to fix that. Like, well, put it on the 10% time board so that when we get to 10% time, we're actually remembering that we have this problem and somebody can look into a solution for it. So it's, it's not just about, um, you know, making sure that you remember what you've done in 10% time so that you can do it again. It's also about remembering what you think might be a good idea so that you can actually do it. Because <laughs> uh, so, so often I see, you know, a problem happens, you're like, oh, I really should fix that. And then a month later, the same problem happens. And you're like, oh yeah, 
I've seen that one before. <laughs> um, so writing them on the board, at least we have a note and people can actually go and check it before the stand up and say, oh, is there actually anything on there that I feel like doing? Um, so I normally try and send a reminder to check the board at the beginning of the day so people are reminded that it's 10% time today and also that they should go and have a think about how they want to use that time effectively um, and what it is they want to do. So um, those are the three things that I think have made the biggest difference. Like I've iterated on those. Originally, we just had a stand up and not a wrap up. And then we didn't have a Trello board and we added that in later. And um, I'm pretty happy with the way that it's working now. And it's actually got to the point where I very rarely go myself. I just make sure there's a room booked for the wrap up um, and people can get on with it. You know, I don't need to be there to do anything. You know, they can do it on their own. There's no, there's no requirement for me to be there. So. How do you get buy-in? Um, this was a big part of uh, my journey into 10% time. So I did want to um, kind of mention it, is that a lot of people don't do it because their team doesn't want to do it or because they can't get their product owner to agree or because their manager doesn't think it's a good idea. And that's a lot of the reason that people are like, oh, I really wish I had that time or I really think it would be valuable, but um, I can't get buy-in. So for me, it was a bit easier because I was the manager. So <laughs> I didn't have to convince anybody. Um, I just kind of did it. But I think it's really, really important to talk about the value you of it you know like that it isn't just oh well the engineers really like having some time to do stuff and we should give it to them because they're expensive um, it's just it's much more important than that right you get so much value out of this time that you wouldn't get anywhere else and it, the value comes straight back into the product right it's not just like oh well they spent this time learning about a library and I'm never going to see that time back it's much more about um, growing these individuals is only a good thing, like making sure that they ha that everybody has time, including, you know, myself, I do 10% time when I can, um, so that we're actually spending time to improve things, you know, we're not just stuck in one place. Um, I can't stand teams that are just like, oh, well, we wish it was better, but we're not doing anything about it, like, we need to do something about it. So. Literally, what I did was I, told, I spoke to all of the product owners of the teams and said, I really want to do 10% time. Here's why. Here's how I think it's going to benefit you. Um, and they were like, oh, well, one day less every two weeks. That's quite a lot of time. Not sure about it. Um, but I basically just kept on hammering until they said, oh, well, maybe I don't, maybe I don't hate the idea. And I was like, that's a yes. Um, <laughs> so um, it, it's really important. If you, want, you know, if you want me to come in and be like, look, <laughs> you need it. Um, it it's really important to, to get that buy-in. And at the end of the day, I think it's something that it's so important that I just push it through. And I think the really key thing is for me is that it's not, it doesn't become a dumping ground. So we're not just saying every time you want to do anything that's good, you have to do it in 10% time because your workplace isn't for that. That's absolutely not how it should be. If something interesting, if you, you know, if you've built a proof of concept that's worked in 10% time, it's no longer 10% time's problem. It has to happen in your product roadmap in the 90% time that you spend doing the rest of your work. Once it's actually developing and delivering value for your product or for your user or for you as an individual, it needs to actually be prioritized against everything else. And, and when I say that, I don't mean it just goes on the bottom of the backlog and everybody forgets about it. We actually need to do it and make it like a real thing. And that's something that's really key for me. And actually, in some ways, it helps for the product owner to see something valuable come out of it, that it isn't just they, these engineers go off and they don't see them again, but that the engineers have gone off and they think about something and they've built it and they're now going to try and actually deploy it to customers. And you can see these value coming out um, of that time. And they're like, oh, actually, I see kind of see what Emily was talking about. <laughs> so where does it go wrong? Because it does all the time. Um, it's very easy to let 10% time slip because of this urgent short term stuff I was kind of referring to before, right? That something's come up, your sprint deadline is happening, it needs to, you need to finish this piece of work, there's a massive bug in production, somebody is coming to your desk and asking you questions, you need to go to a meeting and 10% time isn't happening, you know, like you're, you're running out of time to do it. I can't really tell you that there's like a magic wand that will make this go away. It's just that every single person needs to appreciate and uh, value how important it is, you know, and that actually create time and space and protection for this. Longer term thinking requires discipline. Like you can't just allow it to happen in the background because it doesn't have the short term delivery that a long term, that your short term stuff does, right? So you need to have like a really, really long payoff, which means you have to put in a lot of time now for happiness a long, a long way away. And we're naturally bad at that as people. So I think it's really just, it's about discipline, you know, like you can't let it slip because it, just because it's 10% time and it's like a special thing, it doesn't make it any less important than the rest of the stuff you have going on. And it needs to have just as much um, care and attention put into it. Um, 
I think it's also really important that product is included, you know, like I invite them to the wrap up and we talk to them about what we've done and they're there at the stand up to take part. Sometimes they take part themselves and spend that time kind of doing some exploratory testing that they wouldn't have done otherwise. And I think that the more people you can include in management, product stakeholders and say, really, this is just a time for all of us. It's nothing to do with us and you, like an us versus them scenario is just terrible. Like they should be able to be part of this conversation and be part of the solution and be part of like enjoying 10% time and, and wanting it to do well and, and be part of it all. Um, so it's it's a journey. You aren't going to get there straight away. Um, but I think that those are the important things, like make sure that it's getting the care and attention that it needs in order to be a success. The second thing that goes wrong is that you get trapped in this cycle of having nothing to do or that you're reading a book, but you aren't really getting any value out of it. And you don't really know like how to define the value that you're getting out of it. So you're like, I'm reading this book for personal development. But uh, once I've finished, I don't know whether or not I'll be any more developed. So I think it's it's this is still discipline. You know, like the discipline is still really important. You need to have goals and you need to be able to have like ways to measure those goals so that when you have done the work that you said you were going to do, you can actually define whether or not you're any closer to your goal than you were before. Um, so time is hugely valuable, but you need discipline. You can't just say, here's a day, good luck to you, I'll see you later. <laughs> like It won't magically fix anything. Um, it needs to have this uh, care and attention and, and actually that people care about what comes out as much as what goes in um, to make it really successful and that we get value out of it as a team. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what we've actually done in 10% time Maybe some of this is valuable for you guys. Maybe it's completely just boasting about the cool stuff that we do. We shall see. So a little reminder about what it is we're trying to do, right? So I've tried to group the suggestions, like the uh, examples kind of around these things. <coughs> people improving themselves, people improving the product, people improving the process. And some of my own stuff is in there for my trumpet. Um, so first thing is self-improvement. So we actually have a lot of people, as I kind of mentioned before, that write talks or blog posts during 10% time. Um, it creates this amazing kind of immediate feedback group where the 10% time gang uh, reads the blog post or watches the talk um, and gives feedback before we take it out on the road, you know, publish that talk or, or take the, um, sorry, publish the blog post or take that talk on like a conference uh, road trip. So these are two of uh, engineers who worked in my team, both kind of done this stuff in 10% time, wrote a talk about the library cats from Monty and uh, wrote a uh, blog post about how to be a good software engineering interviewer and interviewee. Um, so examples of stuff that we're doing uh, in 10% time. Uh, these are two um, open source libraries that people have built in 10% time. They actually um, built the thing to help their own product development, like they had already built it pre 10% time. And what they did in 10% time was make it open source. So they kind of made sure that all the documentation was together and that the uh, testing was up to scratch and then created it in, in our kind of open source environment at OVO. So um, if you go on the OVO Tech GitHub, there's like a bunch of open source libraries on there. And these two are ones that people have built in 10% time. Uh, Phil had built this HTTP4S metrics implementation based on Micrometer. And um, Fabio and Phil both uh, worked on this dinosaur, a uh, DynamoDB client for FS2, as I mentioned, we do a lot of Scala. The dinosaur name was my idea. Yeah. Um, so the top right uh, example uh, is actually a really good uh, thing where something started in 10% time and became a real thing that then went onto the backlog. So um, as I've mentioned, my teams are doing international expansion and we were looking at trying to use our existing login infrastructure in uh, Spain. Um, and so someone from the authentication team built a proof of concept of like how a login page might look if we span it up in like a multi ram environment for our key host, uh, key cloak, sorry. And, uh, and this was the page that he kind of put together. I think it took him two 10% times to do. Um, and then once we'd actually kind of proved that it did work, it then went back onto the product backlog and actually we built the real thing. And this is a picture of the real thing, which looks identical um, for, uh, for us to use in Spain. Um, and then the bottom left, GDPR. Um, <laughs> we, were we were originally, when someone had, when a right to be deleted request came in, we would just go around and delete them manually from every database. Anyone else? Hands up. Who does that? No one. <laughs> um, and so we created this script to do it, uh, do it automatically. So we'd enter in their email address, and it would search through all of our databases and delete them um, so that they would be deleted, as the point is. And then it would send some emails to people who also needed to delete them. It was quite a funky little tool, but built in 10% time, just like iterated on a little bit at a time to try and make it um, a little bit easier to do, save some time, make that manual step a little bit um, less painful. Um, 
this is my page. <laughs> Did it myself. So uh, when I get time to do 10% time, um, have has anyone used this dashing framework before? Smashing? It's brilliant. It's written in Ruby, which I know nothing about. Um, but it basically just allows you to build widgets that can read from anywhere and publish metrics to this page. Um, so I've been putting together um, this dashboard of kind of uh, helpful hints <laughs> for each team to be able to measure their own improvements. For me, it's really, really important that if you say you want to improve in some way, that you actually are able to measure whether or not you are improving rather than just saying, I feel like it's better now. Um, so there are some uh, things I've put together to allow you to do that. So um, in the top left, this is literally just a count of how many uh, pull requests we've closed across all of our GitHub repos since Monday. Um, this is uh, master builds that are currently failing in Circle CI. This one's currently failing. Possibly shouldn't have shared that with you. Um, we have like open PRs across all of our repos um, and how long they've been open for. So if they go over three days, they go red. And I start going, guys, <laughs> we need to close these PRs. Um, the purple ones are ones that have been reviewed. Um, and then how often we're deploying our software. And at the end, we've just got like a rotating thing that prints out our definition of done and definition of ready. This one bottom left is actually my favorite. It reads through our public Slack channel and looks for anywhere that there's a question mark that's been posted by someone who's not in the team. And somebody who is in the team that responds get a point. So it tries to work out like who's answering questions in the public Slack channel. Especially when I had the group platform teams, it was really, really helpful to see who was on there, like answering questions all the time and who wasn't doing anything. <laughs> um, and so instead of me going like, mm, I think you should maybe stop making Steve answer all the questions. Like, I think you should do some. I could just put this up on the board and be like, do it yourself. You know, you can see who's doing all the work, like sort it out. Um, as you can see here, we had one question and Henry answered it. Well done, Henry. Um, at the bottom, um, I built this little app that runs off of uh, Google Sheets that reminds people when the tech time talks are, as I mentioned before, the shared talks that we do in our offices. Um, so either if there isn't one, it reminds them to try and sign up, never works. If there is one, it reminds people to go, does work. So um, that was quite a nice little thing um, that we put together. So this is my conclusion slide. We made it to the end. Um, 10% time, no less important, no less effort. You know, it's just as important as the 90% of the time. If you want to get as much value out of it as you're getting out of your actual work, you need to put as much effort into making it successful. We spend so much time like trying to work out how our agile process needs to be better and iterating and improving and trying to build our better backlogs and thinking about how we need to improve as individual teams. But we spend so little time actually thinking about how we want to improve as individuals and how we want to bake that stuff into our day to day and how we actually want to make sure that we get time and space to do this work and, and improve. Um, so this is no less important than the rest of it. You know, it needs to have at least a tenth of the importance <laughs> um, and, and that we put that effort into making 10% time effective by adding the same kind of um, discipline and, and uh, improvement cycles to the, the space that we're creating for 10% time um, instead of just ignoring it and hoping that it will happen on its own. So that's it. Thank you very much. I also have my necessary credit slides for my slides that I didn't make. So please do read this. Thank you so much, Emily. That uh, was a very great talk. Uh, that's good tips in there. Do a stand up, wrap up. <laughs> oh, that's really good. I'm definitely going to take that away. Uh, we do have time for some questions, but um, I'm going to have to ask you to wait for the mic. Yes, yeah, so if I pass the mic around. Also, if we could do one at the very back and then one at the very front and then one sure. at the very back and then one at the very front. <laughs> He's really going to enjoy Emily, that. Emily, do you want to stand on that side? Yeah. Uh, uh, mate, there is only me. one, so I'm going to pass it to you. If you yeah, <laughs> back there. Sorry. So if, if you're going to give Stephen Pemberton Amsterdam, uh, so if you're go going to give people 10% uh, time, mm. um, do you think it's better as you do it uh, once every two weeks or a half day every week? I think that's kind of up to the individual team. It kind of depends on what you're working on. I personally prefer a whole day. So I feel like you do the morning and then you want to stay involved in it for the afternoon or you do the morning of your normal work and then you don't remember to take time off in the afternoon. So I would, I personally prefer a day every two weeks, but I hate a blanket rule. So do what you want. <laughs> there was one. I think there was one down. at the front. Maybe. Oh yeah, yeah. Got my questions. <laughs> um, how do you deal with, or what's your view on, does all tech debt belong in 10% time? Or do you 
do you have a system to identify that? Absolutely not, no. <laughs> um, I don't think if you just make it the dumping ground for, temp, for tech debt, then you're never going to do anything good, right? You're never going to spend any time in, like improving yourself as an individual and learning about things if you're only ever paying down tech debt that you should really be paying down in other places. It's okay to spend some time thinking about tech debt in that time if you think that's what you want to do, but I think tech debt needs to be dealt with in your 90% time um, or 100% of the time because if you don't have a maintainable and uh, you know repeatable way of dealing with it, it's, it's just going to get out of hand. So it, it needs to be more evenly thought about, but also sometimes there's, there is a value in spending 10% time doing those larger pieces of thinking that are kind of sometimes classified as tech debt so that we can actually break that work down and meaningfully do it in our real, like, real work. Um, so no clear answer, really. I, in, until someone finds a way of actually dealing with tech debt in a, in a good fashion, you know, if you know anything, please tell me, because I have no idea. <laughs> this is going really well. OK, someone in this row is next, right? Because it, it's going, I love it. Um, so you, you mentioned about trying to get people working together where they don't normally during 10% mm -hmm. time. Have, have you been able to get that to happen with people working between different sites actually in 10% time? And if you oh. have, how did you manage to get that working? Interesting. Um, ish, but only by cheating. So not really. <laughs> um, I think getting people to collaborate between sites is possibly one of the hardest problems that you have to face as an um, engineer in general. Like when I was at Bloomberg, we were trying to combine work between London and New York, now here in uh, Ovo, we're trying to do it between Bristol and London, and though it seems less far away, it's equally hard. You know, it's just so ridiculously complicated to try and get people to really think about each other when they're not physically present. Um, so we do have a member of our team who's 100% remote, and he does join 10% time, and people pair with him from the London office. But as I say, it's kind of a cheat because they knew him from before, and then he went remote, so it, it wasn't really the whole shebang. Um, so it, it is possible for people to join remotely, like we do do it if people are working from home, they can still join 10% time, but sharing. 10% time with teams that are not in the same office as me is, is just harder. I haven't, like currently the teams that do it are just the teams that I have managed um, rather than any specific like collection of people. Um, so haven't really got a good way of doing that, but it, it should be possible, right? As long as you make it kind of remote friendly, um, you, you're capable of doing it. Yes, at the front. Come on, no, we, come on to the we front. We have a question in the back first, uh, so I'm gonna take a breather here. Unbelievable. Um, hi, uh, so. I think we're quite good. Um, I work at Dyson. Um, quite good at protecting the ten percent time, sort of as management and making sure that it happens. Mm. Uh, what I have seen quite a lot of, though, is kind of uh, good-natured, good-intentioned suggestions for things that could be done there. And I think they've all been very good ideas. But have you had any sort of advice for making it clear that? Because I think there's an it, it sort of implication if it comes from management or something like that. This is something that you should work on, mm. but to try and protect not just the 10%, but what you do in it? Sure. It's a good question. And uh, I tend to be a bit heavy handed with this and be like, you're not doing that. <laughs> That's a piss take. Um, but uh, I think, you know, it really, it's just about reinforcing the message of why we're doing it. You know, it's not just you can spend some time doing something that's like really, really loosely connected to work, but not all the time. You know, you have to bring it back in and actually do something that's valuable. And, and what I tend to do really is, is just kind of mention things in retros and then allow the conversation to develop and then be like, I really think we should look at that in 10 percent time and just hope that it happens. I try not to say, this must happen, this must happen, this must happen. I definitely veto, but in order to get things on the backlog, I tend to just kind of bring up the topic of conversation and then, and then hope that people take me up on it rather than the other way around. I feel like I'm so close, do I need a microphone? <laughs> um, hi, I'm Sean Ed from Oco Health. Um, you're talking about right to be forgotten, which is really interesting as the GDPR rules are really coming into force. So have you seen a rise in these requests? Yeah. Well, when so, can first... you kind of quantify it? Oh, sure. Wow. What a question. Um, so obviously at the beginning, we had loads of them and then it massively dropped off um, and we're not seeing so many of them anymore. It kind of comes in little bumps, depending on whether or not we've sent a marketing email recently. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I don't have the exact figures or data in terms of like how frequently they come in. I'm more in the realms of like spend as little time on it as possible and remain legally compliant. <laughs> I think the one at the back was first. Was, was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I could be telling you anything. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi. Um, do you have any part-time or flexible workers in your teams and how does the 10% time work with them? Um, really good question. It also relevant for people who are on holiday or like are out of the office for that day or can't make it on that particular day because they're doing something else. I don't have any part time workers in my particular team, um, but I very much encourage people to do like backup 10 percent time if they aren't there on like the actual day we're doing it together. So um, it does tend to be it falls back into the trap of not happening because it doesn't get the like overarching protection of everyone doing it together but I have an agreement with everybody that if you can't do it on the real day you should take another day and if you want me to come in and be like no no they're on 10% time today then I can um, so I think it's, it's really important that you get it back you know that if you aren't there on the day that we're doing it that we do it on a day where you can do it and if there's like a recurring reason why you can't do it then we do it on a different day to try and get as many of the team involved as possible. There is still one at the back row. Oh, my as well. oh okay, same question. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, there, one, there we two go. Over here. Hi, uh, my name's Jamie, uh, work at the BBC. I was just wondering, on as a follow-up on the part-time question, um, would you would you actually still make the 10% a 10% part of the part-time that they work? As in, if they only work three days a week, mm then do you scale that down to whatever the math is, but less than a day every two weeks? What would you do? I don't like that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, whatever you want to do, you know, like the way that I manage really is to, to ask someone, like, what do you think's right? You know, rather than say, well, you must do this. I try not to set these degree, decrees of you must follow my rule. It's much more about you're a sensible person. I'm a sensible person. We both have context of what work needs to get done. How do we want to work this together? You know, is one day every week appropriate? Is it one day a month? Is it one day every three weeks? Like, what do you what do you think's relevant for you? And then whatever you think is right, then we try and make that happen. That I try and be reasonable as much as possible <laughs> with such requests. You know, and and at the end of the day, we do have other stuff to do. But this is, as I say, it's equally important. So I want to create space for people to do it. And having a third of a day seems a bit rubbish. So <laughs> you'd want a whole day. It's just how often you'd want to do it. There was another one further. Yeah, just a few people along. Look at this. I'm being so nice to you. Hi, thanks. You talked about uh, motivating the people below you and getting buy-in from the people to, mm. to do this in the first time, and you slightly glossed over people above you. Sure. Um, so what would your advice be for selling this upwards, mm. um, particularly when you start, when you can't prove that a 10% time is going to uh, generate a net benefit, a net positive? Um, uh, uh, and, and talking upwards to management and suggesting maybe that the, the business only runs for 90%, I su suspect it's quite a hard sell. Well, it depends on whether or not you have a culture of trying. You know, like if you're in a culture of iterating and improving, then suggesting an experiment shouldn't be too far removed from what you do anyway, right? If you're already in the um, kind of agile iterative improvement cycle, then saying, I'd like to try this, can we do it for a bit and see whether or not it's effective, um, should be easier to sell than completely blank. Now, if you're in a culture that doesn't do that, then you've got a much bigger problem. <laughs> and now you're now looking at like, how do you experiment and iterate in general, including 10% time, and that's much harder to sell. Um, so then you're kind of talking about, you know, systematic change <laughs> of culture in order to bring you to a place where you're able to make suggestions for improvements as individuals. And for me, that's part of the reason that I left my last job was because they weren't really willing to kind of take those things on, you know, like you weren't, they weren't in a culture of trying to iterate and improve. And that's something that's really, really important to me that people, when you say, I think this is a good idea, here's the research that I've done, can we give it a go? Say yes, because if you're just getting constant no's, then, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a, an, an unhelpful place to be, whether you're talking about 10% time or not. So, 10% time should fall into your natural uh, process of experimenting, improving. And if you don't have one, then you need an, like an agile coach or <laughs> some kind of dramatic change of structure so that you're able to do that. You know, that your manager is open to the idea that you as individuals have ideas. None of them are terrible. They all deserve airtime and that you should be able to be heard and, and reasonably thought about. So if you're going to them and say, I'd like a day every two weeks to do nothing, they're definitely going to say no. If it's like, I'd like a day every two weeks and here's what the benefit is and here's how it's worked in other places and this is how I think it's going to work here and here's some stuff we could do, I hope they'd be more likely to say yes. And if they don't, then leave and come work forever. Thank you. Oh, there you go. It's time for last question. Hmm. 
Hello. Um, you talked about uh, measures and measures of success, and teams often get very heavily measured these days, whether it's velocity or any of the many other things we kind of we throw at teams. Has having 10% time impacted the measures that were already taking place on the team? So you're having to justify a lower velocity, or has it had a positive impact? So I think velocity is a bit of a cheat measure, really. Like, it shouldn't really be telling you how quickly you're working, because Agile isn't about fast. I kind of have a ban on the word fast. I hate it in all its forms. <laughs> um, but in terms of, like, what you're measuring should be, are we meeting, like, our KPIs? Are we delivering the value that we're delivering as a team? And hopefully the answer to that is still yes, right, because you're getting value out of 10% time that you're just seeing in different ways. Um, so if you're measuring things literally on a day-by-day -day basis, then I would recommend not doing that because it's a useless metric. Um, but saying, you know, we are going to do less work in the sprint, but over a longer period, we're going to see more value. This is what I'm talking about with like long term measures, you know, like you have to be willing to put time in now in order to see benefit in three months. You know, are we actually able to do work um, in a less um, kind of we're not held back as much as we were before because we are more sustainable as a business? Um, isn't something you're going to see in velocity or on your day-to-day -day or week-to-week. -week. You're looking at something much, much longer. Um, and, and that is harder to sell, right? Because you're, you're not looking at your numbers at the end of the month. You're looking at how your engineering department is working at the end of the year. Um, and, and measuring that is harder. And like talking about it structurally is harder. Um, but hopefully, if you're measuring the right things, then it won't have the same impact. So velocity isn't going to help you, definitely. Your velocity will go down. But overall, you should go up. That's some great questions. Thank you very much, Emily, once again. Thanks, guys.